I don't know how many of you are feeling this way, but I feel like I have been displaced by an hour, as if I have traveled someplace remotely and not had the privilege of actually getting there, but still suffering the consequence of, which is uh, almost defeating in itself. The, um, I'm all for the fact that if the U.S. decides that they indeed will pass that bill and leave clocks the way they are, um, I'm all for that. And so that's my only little political plug for this morning. So that's the only one I'll give. But and uh, I'm I'm excited about Easter coming up as well. And uh, for those of you who don't know, um, and that uh, we uh, uh, I work with youth pastors here in the, in the region, and uh, have for a number of years. And about 17, 18 years ago now, and uh, we started something with the youth pastors, which was basically a challenge to them to say, can we do something here in the region that reflects our unity that we have in Jesus? And um, never mind the theological differences we might have with our churches and stuff and that, but can we do something for our youth that reflects the unity that we have in Christ? Believe it or not, the discussion took place well over a year and um, as we tried to figure out what could be done. And then it was decided that we would hold the youth conference on Good Friday, and uh, we would call it no other name because Good Friday is still the only calendar holiday that is only about Jesus. It's the only one. We don't have anything else that we wrap into that day um, and that it is all about Jesus. And so we thought we're going to hold a conference. We're going to call it no other name, and it will be just about Jesus. And then we decided to do something completely radical, And that is, we said, we'll never advertise the speaker. We'll never advertise who's leading workshops or what the special things are or anything else like that. We're just going to tell people, come, because what we're promising you is that it's only going to be about Jesus. Believe it or not, in that first year that we did that conference um, and that, uh, we had a lot of parents who said they wouldn't send their kids because we wouldn't tell them who the speaker was. And and that. But we had 180 kids that showed up. Um, Since that time, we average right now just under 1,000. And that, and it's been going on for every year. And we still have speakers that come from all different parts of the country and the U.S. and stuff, and they look at us in, in shock when we tell them, you can't put this on your social media, you can't put this on your, um, your own web pages or anything else like that because it, we don't advertise the speaker. And they go, so I can't tell people I'm going there? And you say, no, you can't tell people you're coming here. And um, they come and they're absolutely shocked. They have never seen any other event like it where we don't advertise and push the speakers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and youth come, and lives are touched and lives are changed. So please keep that event in mind and keep it in prayer for us as we go forward uh, this year with uh, Easter and with Good Friday and with the uh, conference that's going to be happening there. This morning I'm going to be sharing with you from John chapter 16. Um, there's going to be the verses that are going to be showing up on the screen behind me there so you'll be able to follow along. But if you have a Bible or electronic version or a paper version or whatever you prefer to use, open it up and uh, and let's go together with that. And um, I'm going to be basically looking at uh, from verse 16 right till the end of the chapter, and I'll be highlighting some of the things that are in there for us to be able to appreciate what's happening here. It starts off in verse 16 by um, Jesus basically referring to the fact of his upcoming death and resurrection. And that's what he's been referring to for a number of the, of the discourse uh, portions here in, in the previous chapters as well. And he basically has been letting them know once again, I just want you to know and that the Son of Man is going to be arrested. He's going to be taken. He's going to be tortured. He's going to be crucified. Oh, but on the third day, he will rise again. What's amazing about it, though, I want you to be able to appreciate, and that the, despite the fact that he is repeating this message over and over and over again, his disciples still have one perspective in mind, and that is that Jesus is coming, and he will establish a messianic kingdom. And that's what's going to take place. And he's going to establish his rule here on earth. And even though they hear Jesus saying this stuff about dying on the, and, and being tortured and being arrested and, and rising again on the third day, none of that is impacting. None of that's taking hold. And the reason it's not taking hold is because they already have in mind a perspective on what he should be doing and how he will operate and how he will make these things come about. The disciples weren't alone in that. Um, If you uh, can refer to it another time, but back in Luke chapter 7, 
and, um, and that. You have John the Baptist, who basically sends a message to Jesus after John's been put in prison, and that by King Herod at the time. You can look at it and find out more of the context of that story. But he's been put in prison, and uh, he's facing death. He knows it. And uh, he sends a message to Jesus. Are you the one we were to expect? Or should we look for somebody else? Now here's the forerunner of Christ saying this. And what's amazing is that how Jesus responds. He goes about, continues to teach, and he heals a whole bunch of people that day. And then he says to John's disciples and sends them back to the prison with this message. And the message is simple. The blind see, the deaf hear. Those who are sick are getting well. The good news is being preached. And by the way, blessed, flourishing, is the person who does not stumble because of the way that I do things. Because of the way that I do things. The reason I want to emphasize this at the beginning here is because I want us to be able to appreciate something. And that is that you and I, yes, I'm including you with me in this, and uh, not just me, myself, because the preacher's always doing that. I have this problem. And everybody just sits there and nods. Yeah, you do. And, um, but we all have this problem. We have an understanding, a grid work, in terms of how we think God should operate. We have an understanding of what we think Jesus should do and what he should be like and how he would take a stand on a certain issue or not take a stand on another issue or how he would respond to something. We all have that grid work that we run things through. What we need to try and make certain is, though, is that our grid work is indeed how Jesus would do this and how he would operate. His disciples, fascinating about it, and then it, said, it says that they're talking amongst themselves about, what does he mean <laughs> his time is short? What does he mean he's, he's leaving soon? What does he mean he's going away? What does he mean he's going to the Father? And they're just talking about it amongst themselves. And the way the passage is written in the Greek, you get the idea that quite a bit of time has passed here. And that as they've been discussing it quietly by themselves, and Jesus is almost like he's gone quiet now for a while. But Jesus knows what they're asking, but they're not asking him. And so finally he says to them, listen, I'll explain it to you. And... Um, and he addresses the question. They wanted to ask him, but they didn't. And so he tries to explain it to them. I love what it says then, is that Jesus then says to them, he says, by the way, he says, I want you to be able to realize something. You need to understand what's going to be taking place, and the Greek there means it's going to be happening soon. You're going to be experiencing a lot of anguish. You're going to be experiencing a lot of grief. And the words that are used there imply the fact, heavy loss, a deep loss. There's going to be things that are going to be shattered for you broken for you and you need to be able to appreciate it's going to be happening shortly and why is he saying that because you're going to see me fulfilling what i told you i'm going to be arrested i'm going to be tortured i'm going to be crucified i'm going to die on the cross but on the third day i will rise again but in between that and the third day you will experience a lot of anguish you'll experience a lot of grief but then there will come real joy but the joy will come because I will rise again from the dead. And by the way, when I rise again from the dead, it's going to bring a whole new understanding to the way that you approach life, your story, your understanding of me, your understanding of the Father. All of that's going to change. What I want to look at here this morning as well, though, and I want to kind of zero in on this for a little bit, and that is um, verse 23. And uh, verse 23 says, and my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Isn't that a great promise? As a matter of fact, it's a promise he's already mentioned a couple of other times. He mentions it in John 15, 16, and John 14, verses 13 and 14. He states the same point. Ask anything in my name, and it will be done. Ask my Father for anything in my name, and it will happen. Isn't that a great promise? Why do you all look so skeptical? Now, without a show of hands, because we don't want to put anybody on the spot, okay, but just in your own heart and that, how many of you have known that in your prayer life that absolutely comes true 100% all the time? Now, why is he paused? Why is there so much silence all of a sudden? Has he got nothing else to say? No, that's it. That's the end of the message here this morning. I'm going to turn it back over to Danny. No, I'm kidding. And that. But I want us to be able to understand something and appreciate something. And that is that Jesus said this. This is the third time he mentions it. Why is it that we don't experience that in our prayer life? As a matter of fact, I think that this particular promise that's given to us, and it is a promise, 
And, that, and it's repeated twice before that. This particular promise has been terribly mishandled over the years. And as a matter of fact, it's taught very poorly. And I don't mean, I don't mean here at Pine Grove. I don't know that, what you've taught on this. And so maybe I'm already just sharing stuff that you've already known about this as being a truth. And that. But I know that in my experience of being in many, many churches and working with many pastors and youth pastors over the years, um, this truth has been terribly mishandled. And even books that have been written on prayer often mishandle this truth. And so I want to clarify a few things for you here this morning on that. You okay with that? Yeah? Okay. So let me, go, let me launch into this with you and that. Um, here's the key, and that is that it is a promise. It's a promise that Jesus wants us to take seriously. But there are factors around this promise that we have to take into consideration as well. And here is where I want you to be able to appreciate something, and that is that Scripture should be used to interpret Scripture. And, um, and oftentimes we don't do that. And so oftentimes what we, you and I like to do, you and I, see that? You and I like to do is we like to take a promise and claim it or take a portion of Scripture and claim it without fully understanding not just its contextual meaning, but also how it's used and understood in other parts of Scripture. So I want you to be able to appreciate this. Here's the thing. Jesus puts a caveat on this. He puts a, he puts a condition on this. But oftentimes we miss the condition. But it was just there previously in John chapter 15, verse 7. And, um, and basically it's this. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask me whatever you wish. Now, did you catch the first parts of that? If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask me whatever you wish. In other words, what he's saying to us here is that I want you to be able to appreciate something. I want such a personal relationship with you. I want such a connection with you that the honest truth is that you will be walking with me in an intimacy that is a brand new experience in life. And when you do, ask me. Ask me whatever you wish. And it's a reflection then of this promise. But what does that mean? Here's the beautiful thing. Jesus has never asked you and I to do something that he has not fully experienced himself. He's never asked us to do that. When Jesus talks about his ministry, and this is all from the book of John, by the way, which is kind of interesting. This is what I mean by we have to take sometimes the promises, the messages that are given in the book as a whole. And when Jesus talks about his own ministry, he talks about it this way. He says in John 5, 19, and that, for example, he says, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing because whatever the father does, the son does also. Isn't that interesting? There's never been a moment in Jesus' ministry where he did anything that the Father wasn't already doing. In other words, he saw what the Father was doing, and he got involved. There was such an intimate connection between the two of them. The other thing he says to us is in John 12, 49, he says, And the Father who sent me commanded me what to say and how to say it. And, uh, and then he goes on, he says, And the Father living in me, in John 14, 10, The Father living in me who is doing his work. He's been doing his work through me. He's living in me. And this is what makes it possible. And then he's saying to you and to me, hey, and by the way, you can experience the same kind of relationship with me. You can experience the same type of relationship with the Father. And what he's telling us is this. We need to connect more with the giver, not just with what we want given, but rather we need to connect more with the giver. How intimately are we walking in connection with the Father, in the power of the Spirit, in intimacy with Jesus. And when you realize that not a single time did Jesus do a healing, not a single time did he do a miracle, not a single time did he teach anything without being completely and intimately connected with the Father and knowing that this is what the Father wanted to see take place. So what does that mean for prayer? It means then that when we are walking in that type of connection, that type of intimacy, we'll even know what to ask for. How many of you have prayed prayers that you know you really want to see answered? And you have a strong belief that it is in the will of God. Okay, so in other words, it's not just my past prayers where I've prayed for a nice baby blue Porsche convertible, etc. Lord, I'd really like you just to sort of put it in my driveway one day with the keys and it's mine, it's paid for, insurance taken care of. 
not that. But how many of you have prayed prayers that you know, God, I, 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 I have no doubt this is within your will. I have no doubt, God, that you care and are compassionate and you're loving and you want to see this take place as well. And then I have put this clause on it. But not my will, but your will be done. Ever pray that? Moments of honesty? Yeah. Why do we put that there? Well, I'm just going to share now from my perspective why I've done it. Okay? I'm not going to include you in this, but I'll just say it for myself. And then you can wonder, why did we invite him as a speaker? Look at that in his life. Anyway, here's why I've put this in there. Not my will, but your will be done. I use it sometimes as an escape clause. As an escape clause. And I realized that as I've been looking at my prayer life over the years and analyzing what I'm doing and, Lord, why aren't these prayers answered and trying to struggle through that and wrestle that with God and then all of a sudden realize that and oftentimes I use this as an escape clause. And at the end of it, I'm saying things like, God, not my will, but your will be done. And, um, and, and basically, I'm saying it because Jesus modeled it in prayer. He's in the garden just shortly after this discourse. He's in the garden praying. And three times he says, please take this cup from me. Please take this cup from me. Now realize he's saying that after declaring over and over and over again, for this reason I've come. For this reason I'm here. I am the Lamb of God who's supposed to take away the sin of the world. For this reason I have come. And he states it over and over and over again. And here he is in the garden, being fully human but fully God. But being fully human, take this cup from me. Take this cup from me, but not what I will, but what you will. And I realize that I have modeled that oftentimes in my prayers, but I use it as an escape clause. And if I'm being really honest, can I be transparent with you? You okay with that? Can you handle my transparency? Yeah? Okay. In my transparency, you know what I'm sometimes meaning? And that is that uh, a surrender that's basically passive. In other words, I'm just saying, okay, sera, sera. I guess whatever it will be, will be. And so God, go ahead. And not my will, but your will be done. Other times, even worse though, I use it as a resignation. As a resignation. And it's basically a thing where I'm just looking to God and saying to him, okay, well, you know what? Whatever. Whatever. I mean, you're the one who's in control. You're the one who's all-powerful. You know what the truth is, God? You're going to do it your way anyway. And I use it as a resignation. Is that too transparent? But I use it that way, as an escape clause, just in case, God, you don't come through. After you told me, ask whatever I want, and you'll do it for me. And I think I'm doing it all in the right way, and it's still not being answered. So you know what, God? There's my escape clause. I came to a new appreciation for what that actually means and how Jesus used those words in the garden, not my will, but your will be done. And that is that there's nothing passive about it. There's nothing passive about it. There's nothing that basically is, is, is Jesus saying, oh, here's my escape clause. There's nothing that's a surrender that sort of says, oh, well, whatever. Whatever. You're, you're going to be, it's going to work the way you want it to anyway. So, yeah, whatever. It has nothing to do with that. As a matter of fact, it's an active statement. It's an action statement. And what it basically is declaring is this. It's a powerful statement of faith. And it is trust in the loving one and the loving care of God and God the Father. And in God's compassionate, absolute power, I trust that his wisdom far surpasses my own and that I cannot even imagine a better outcome in this situation than the one he's planning. And he's planning it because of his unbelievable, powerful love, compassion, and care for me. And so when Jesus says that, not my will, but your will be done, what he's doing is he's making a powerful statement, a powerful declaration that, hey, I want you to know something, though. I trust your love for me. And in your love for me, your power has no limit in what you can do. You can take this cup from me. But if you think there's a better way and I need to drink this cup, then you want to know something? I trust your love love for me and your wisdom and your direction and your sovereignty and your care i trust it and i declare that 
And that's why at the very end, when Jesus is on the cross, right after he says the words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Another word for that would be, why have you abandoned me? But at the end, what does he do? He says, into your hands I commit my spirit. And why is he saying that? Because he's going back to this. Because I've already declared that not my will, but your will be done. Because your will is directed by your love, your care, your compassion, your power, and your wisdom. And I don't want anything less than that in my story. And therefore, for the joy set before him, Jesus endures the cross. His disciples, after Jesus tells them what he's been trying to get them to be able to appreciate and understand here about the fact that he's moving on, he's going on. And, he's, and they come back to him and they say, you know something in verse 29 and 30? They say, you know all things. That's unbelievable. I really believe what they're saying here is not a question that Jesus is omniscient, that they're actually believing that he has that complete attribute of God that he's all-knowing. Rather, what they're doing is they're saying, yeah, you knew the question we were asking, we didn't even ask you. Hey, you want to know something? That's good enough for us. We believe in you now and that it makes us believe. I like how Jesus handles that, and I want you to be able to appreciate that. And that is he looks at his disciples, and I love what he says in verse 31. You believe at last? And it's a question mark. As a matter of fact, another way of interpreting that would be, do you now believe? Like, really? And he's challenging them a little bit. He's accepting that at least they've taken a small step of faith, but he's looking at them and saying, Don't think this faith is as strong as you think it is. How do you like that? And I want you to be able to appreciate that. The father who brings his son who's demon-possessed before the Lord, and the disciples can't cast the demon out of this boy. And they finally bring him before Jesus. And and Jesus looking at this thing in the whole bit, and the father says to him, if you can do anything, please do it. And then I love Jesus' response, if? If? And then I love the father's response, I know you can do it, but help me in my unbelief. Because the honest truth is, God, the story has beaten me down. The story has beaten me down. So it's even hard for me to believe anymore. It's even hard for me to be able to think to myself that I have enough faith to believe that this can be different anymore. What I want to be able to encourage you in your prayer life is never be afraid to say to God, God, I do believe, but help me in my unbelief. Because the honest truth is, The story has broken me. So help me in my unbelief. Jesus then tells them, I want you to be able to know something. He said, things are going to get worse. Things are going to get worse. He's basically, he's letting them know. I'm going to be honest with you. Things are going to get worse. And, um, but I want you to be able to know something too. It's not just going to get worse. As a matter of fact, what you guys are saying to me that you do believe, I just want you to be able to know something. When when it really does get worse, you're all going to abandon me. You're all going to run in different directions, back to your own homes. You're all going to leave, and you're going to leave me alone. And I want you to be able to appreciate that the way this is written in this passage, it is written with Jesus expressing this with anguish, with anguish. Isn't that amazing? He was so fully human, he needed human connection. Even though he says, but my father will still be there. My father will still be there. He still needed human connection. And he's expressing this in a way of, it's going to hurt. But I want you to know something. I am giving you my peace. I'm offering you my peace. And he's offering the promise of this peace, knowing fully well that they're going to abandon him, but he wants them to be able to know that when you start to come back, I want you to be able to realize you saw this moment coming, didn't you, Jesus? You saw this moment coming in the story. You knew the story would put us in a place where it actually would force us away from you rather than draw us to you. And yet what you did, Jesus, was you said to us and gave us this incredible promise. I give you peace. I give you peace. One of the challenges that was sort of interesting was put before me as I was looking at this passage over the last couple of weeks was what is peace? What is peace to you? And I started defining it and suddenly realized to myself that, oh, my goodness, and I was reading a, a... Uh, one of the uh, Greek things on this whole thing, and it was sort of fascinating. I thought, oh my goodness, that's exactly how I define peace. And I thought to myself, I define peace as an absence of conflict. You know something? An absence of, of suffering. An absence of oppression. An absence of war. That's what peace is to me. 
In other words, change the circumstance. Give me peace. And isn't it fascinating, though, that what Jesus is offering here is not change the circumstance. The word that he's using here is a variation of the Hebrew word, shalom. And the word that he's using here means this, a complete sense of well-being, no matter what the circumstance. I'm offering you a complete sense of well-being inside of yourself, no matter what the circumstance. Because I want you to be able to know something. And when he goes on here, he says, I want you to be able to know something. And that is that in this world, you will have, what's the word? Trouble. How many of you have that verse on your wall in your house? How many of you put that written out on your fridge? Isn't that amazing? But that's a promise of Jesus here. In this world, you will have trouble. Aren't you thrilled with that promise? But isn't it more fascinating than what Jesus is saying to you and to me? And that is, but I want you to know something. I'm giving you something the world can't give you. I'm giving you something the world can't give you. And right now, in this day in which we live, by the way, what a, what a place of tension, what a place of stress, what a place of brokenness. Yet you know, Jesus is saying to you and to me, but I'm giving you something the world can't give you. And that is an inner sense of well-being, no matter what the circumstance. Can I take a few more minutes and just illustrate that point a little further? You okay with that? Yeah? Okay. I always think if you're going to go for another 20 minutes, make sure you get permission. And so, um, but here's how I want to be able to help you to be able to really understand that. In both Matthew 7 and Luke 6, and you can look this up later, and that Jesus shares this parable with, the, with his uh, disciples, with the people that he's teaching with at that time. And some of you may be familiar with it. And Jesus is talking about two, two people, and both of them were building a house. And he says, the first person came along, and they built their house upon a rock. And he said, and basically what the word there means, upon a firm foundation that was laid well, deep, secure. And they put their house up. And then Jesus says this, and then the storms came. And then the storms came. Powerful winds, huge amounts of rain, flood conditions. And it says, and they beat against that house. And the house stood firm. And then Jesus says, and then there was this other builder. And he built his house upon no foundation. And he built a house. And then Jesus said the same thing. And then the storm came. Powerful winds. Huge amounts of rain. Flood conditions. And they beat against that house. And the house fell down flat and was destroyed. What's the promise in both those scenarios? The guy who built it with a solid foundation, the person who built it without a foundation. What's the promise in both of those? Hmm? There'll be trouble. Exactly. Good. Well done. There'll be trouble. There's storms, and they're coming your way. You know something? It's sometimes something we don't preach enough about our relationship and walk with God in our relationship with Jesus. It's so easy to just want to be able to gravitate towards things that promise us prosperity, promise us success, promise us that if this door closed, another door will open, it'll be a better door that this will always be the case. This will always be something. We're promising you. What did Jesus promise in his reality? In this world, you will have trouble. You will have trouble. And then, but I like how he concludes that. But I have overcome the world. And you know what he's looking at here? He's looking at his cross and what he's going through and the experiences that he'll face there as being something that I want you to be able to know something. I've already anticipated the victory. I'm already anticipating the victory. I know this is going to work out unbelievably well. But in this world, you will have trouble. But I have given you something the world can't give you, and that is my peace. Oh, and by the way, it comes out with the most beautiful thing of all, and that is intimacy with me, intimacy with my Father, and the promised Holy Spirit who will lead you and guide you in that intimacy. And by the way, in that intimacy then, you can ask. You can ask. But always ask with this understanding that God, the honest truth is, I want your will, not mine. Because in your will, 
it will be unbelievably powerful, directed by your love and directed by a wisdom that I could not even imagine an outcome better than the one that you've got. And I trust your heart behind what you do. And so therefore, God, I will ask. And I will ask that it be your will. But I will ask that it be powerfully done and demonstrated. But I also thank you for this. And that is that you give me within myself that complete sense of well-being because I know you are ultimately almighty God and a loving Father. Thanks for your time.